Hello and welcome to the World Economic Forum here in Geneva, Switzerland. And we're live and joined by more than 120 journalists from around Africa and by World Health Organization officials in three countries. You can follow this conference live on WHO Africa and WEF social media. Delighted to be joined in Congo, Brazzaville by Dr. Michel Yao and two of his colleagues who will be with us very shortly, Dr. Zabalon Yoti and Dr. Machidizo Moetti. Uh, in Senegal, delighted to be joined by Dr. Lucille Imbua. And in South Africa, we have with us Dr. Owen Kalua. We've received very, very many questions from all of you up front, and we'll turn to each of our panelists to get uh, their views on this. And I can see in Senegal, uh, sorry, in Congo, Brazzaville, that we are now joined by Dr. Mweti and by Dr. Yoti, which is fantastic news. They're just settling themselves into position for the call. The first question, top of the list from everyone calling in, why is it that the spread has been apparently slower or later in Africa? And I'm going to turn first to, to Dr. Moetti just to answer that. Why has the spread been apparently slower or later in Africa? And Dr. Moetti, welcome. I think that, you know, we don't have an explanation of why we haven't started seeing cases from the African region up to relatively recently and increasing very fast in the last 10 days or so, I would say. So for the last couple of months, three months since this outbreak started, we have noted as uh, we have seen cases in first Asian countries, then European countries, that there have been relatively few countries that were affected in Africa. But we noted equally that there were relatively few countries affected in South America as well. So our initial thinking, we were wondering, and I'm not saying that this is our view, whether it was related to influenza seasons, because uh, this is a coronavirus like the influenza virus and that we would expect to see an increase in the future, in the, in, the, in the near future. We also were very concerned, of course, about the contact between China as a key uh, economic partner of African countries and African countries all over the continent and assumed and were concerned that the first cases would come from there. So with some hindsight, Perhaps what has happened is the types of measures that the Chinese government put in place relatively early in their own um, outbreak to prevent uh, the spread within China, of course. And they took an, uh, an approach that also very much addressed the potential spread outside of China. They started some interventions for international travelers leaving the country, going elsewhere. People were put into quarantine for 14 days. So that risk was reduced. And it is, as we have seen the virus spread across other regions, uh, principally Europe, which our director general has uh, described now as the epicenter of the outbreak, and with the close travel between European and African countries that we've started seeing travelers from European countries arriving in Africa with infection. And that is the case now in about 28, 27 countries. And then in four other countries in the African region, we have seen community spread, local spread, also principally uh, with the virus initially brought in by either African people or travelers from other regions uh, who were traveling from European countries. Our main concern, of Thank course, you. is to, now that we've seen a quite uh, rapid increase geographically of the spread of this virus across countries. About 10 days ago, we had about five countries affected. Now we've got 30 almost. So it's been an extremely rapid process, rapid evolution. And our main interest is to help the countries to contain this and to delay or prevent local or community spread of the virus. Thank you very much, Dr. Mati. And perhaps we can just get a brief sense from your colleagues in Senegal and in South Africa of their perception of how the uh, the virus has um, developed 
in, in both of their uh, specific regions. Dr. Mbua, can we just turn to you briefly? Okay, good morning. Uh, in Senegal, uh, as we see in the other African countries, we have now uh, 36 cumulative cases confirmed uh, with uh, 20 cases with the local transmission. At the beginning, we have imported cases, but in one sit setting, we have uh, local transmission. And we can see that the, the way of people's lives here in Africa could, uh, could uh, uh, push the, 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 the population to contract vi the virus because uh, there, there is a lot of people in the same uh, house and uh, we can see that it's, it's, a, it's, it's a, a factor for the cat transmission. Mm. Dr. Kalua in uh, South Africa, can we just turn to you and say how uh, speedily has uh, your uh, country uh, represented been affected by this, this virus? Thank you very much. Um, the first case was confirmed in South Africa on the 5th of March. And um, by the 18th of March, which was yesterday, we had 116 uh, cases that are confirmed. Uh, at the beginning, until around the 15th of March, all the cases that we had were cases that were imported. And, uh, and mostly for people, had, South Africans who had retained uh, from uh, travel in Europe. By, by the 15th of March, we reported the first cases, uh, confirmed first cases for local transmission. And as of yesterday, we have 12 such cases that are confirmed to be of local transmission. So within a period of 13 days, we, we have grown from one to 16 to 116 cases with 12 cases of local transmission. And most of these cases are in Hauteng, and that's the province where we have Pretoria and Johannesburg, and uh, also in KwaZulu-Natal, and that's where we have Deban, and in Cape Town, uh, sorry, in um, um, Western Cape, which is where we have Cape Town. So the three hardest hit provinces are those three that I've mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Another of the top questions that we have from journalists around the continent is, given the relative capacity for testing and treatment, along with the crowded living conditions and transportation conditions in Africa's cities, can we expect, um, what can we expect of, of health systems and uh, social structures given uh, the onset of this virus? And Dr. Moeti, I'll go back to you in Brazzaville. Uh, Congo, and perhaps if you want to bring in your colleagues there as well, just to give us some perspective on that. Um, yes, I think these are two aspects of the realities or of the context in many African countries that are of greatest concern to us. First of all, as, as regards um, test kits and the global challenge in the availability of the quantities that countries would like to have of test kits. We would like to encourage, and our Director General said so very clearly a couple of days ago, a very, um, uh, how can I say, a very focused screening and case finding strategy whereby people who have, any people who have suggestive symptoms and those who might be contacts would be tested. This would enable countries to know as early as possible where infected people are and, and uh, initiate then those interventions around social distancing, self-isolation, and the hygiene measures that are so very important for preventing onward transmission. But there is a challenge of uh, availability of test kits. We are aware that uh, there are some manufacturers in a number of countries that are developing new test kits, and we are very keen to work with our colleagues in WHO to uh, proactively explore those possibilities of test kits, particularly testing approaches that would be carried out in a minimally demanding way as broadly and widely as possible so that uh, countries can be able to tell very early on when people are infected 
early in their infection when they start to show symptoms. This continues to be an area of challenge in which we are working with our colleagues in, uh, in, in WHO headquarters. What we have been very encouraged about though is the progress that countries have made in putting in place their capacity to diagnose this uh, virus. Because at the beginning of February, for example, we had only two laboratories in South Africa and in Senegal that were capable of diagnosing uh, this, this virus. Now we have 40 countries that have the capacity, admittedly in the central hospital in the capital city, but at least the need for moving specimens around between countries is very much minimalized now. So that is one area that requires, we think, really intensive work, uh, international collaboration, perhaps public-private partnership to explore to the extent possible. And then the second question, it is true that um, if you like the socioeconomic circumstances of many African people, particularly in urban areas, make social distancing the way it is being recommended quite a challenge. Sometimes families live in houses where you don't have a bedroom for every family member. Uh, quite a few people in the family have to sit in the same space, sleep in the same space sometimes, and, and the facilities are not in place. In addition, it may be in houses that actually do not have running water. So the possibilities of uh, hand washing in the way that it's recommended frequently, hand washing with soap in certain ways is a challenge under those circumstances. We are recommending approaches that are adaptable to, to these circumstances. So for example, working with partners and with governments to make sanitizers available to, to people in health facilities as well as in families. We need to think about what it means to do social distancing at family, at family circumstances where people live in crowded conditions. Mm. And we are thinking, we might have to think differently about the use of masks. These are issues that we are considering within our team. We will need to adapt to the extent possible to these contexts, the principles of not infecting each other either from droplets when people cough or sneeze and also from hands, so keeping hands clean and very much communicating with people about these measures that they need to take. So we're very aware of the challenges presented by these and are looking for ways to innovate around them. I think that using sanitizers, getting the word out to people, making sure that uh, we consider and uh, have access to masks where they may be used in slightly different ways in, in the settings where this is a challenge. These are some of the advice that we are giving to governments and to communities. Dr. Mighty, thank you. And lastly, one, another question that came in from a, a large number of the journalists uh, in today's call is relating to something you touched on at the very beginning, which is the climate and the seasonality. There's been some uh, discussion, uh, some speculation that uh, heat and humidity can act in some way to slow the spread of the virus. Is that something you or your colleagues have experience of or any observations on, or is that something that's not factored into your approach to this crisis at the moment? No, this is something that we are studying at the moment. And so we are looking with our team and some academics in some institutions at what have been the patterns, for example, of influenza in our region and what then we may infer. And here I have to emphasize that these viruses are different. This is a new virus whose behavior we are still trying to understand. But we have noted, as I said, that in, similarly to African countries, in Southern, Af Southern American countries as well, there has been spread, but it has not been the same as we have seen in the global north. So we are trying to understand if this could be related to temperature, to weather. Certainly we know in the past from influenza data that we have a distinct flu season, particularly in the Southern part of the continent and in, in some Eastern African countries. So we may from this infer that uh, we should expect perhaps in a couple of months when the winter sets in in the South to see an increase in the, the rate of transmission of this virus. We are looking at this, looking at uh, data in the past, looking at seasonal patterns and trying to anticipate in a sense what we might expect. 
we don't have this information for this, vir for this particular virus because it is a new virus which has largely been spreading in the north and now we need to understand and anticipate how it might behave in, in African settings. Thank you very much. Um, we have a question from uh, the Portuguese news agency, Lusa, from Cristina Fernandez Ferreira. And I'm just gonna check um, and see if we have Cristina on the line um, here to pose her question. And um, we don't have Cristina uh, in voice form, but we do have her question here. So um, on her behalf, she's asking, as hand washing with water and soap is one of the principal recommendations uh, to avoid transmission, how does the World Health Organization estimate this measure will uh, be carried out in Africa, given there are wide areas with poor access to, to water and drinking water? Perhaps I'll turn it over to one of my colleagues to, to, to respond to this question. Uh, Michelle. Thanks. Perhaps. Yeah, thank you. It is indeed uh, one of the challenges, mainly in uh, rural uh, areas, where access to uh, this uh, item, uh, mainly soap uh, and uh, water, could be an issue. And uh, we have also to think about uh, many displaced uh, population due to uh, security challenges or any other humanitarian uh, crisis. So it's why it's actually necessary to work with uh, different partners, mainly NGO partners, like what we did in the past for some of the outbreak like uh, cholera, where these NGOs were involved in ensuring access to some of the uh, this basic need, um, mainly uh, water as well as sanitation, uh, distributing uh, soap and so on. So this is uh, should be and uh, I'm sure uh, it is already done in many places, part of the uh, preparedness and readiness strategy of countries or NGO partners prepositioning this item and thinking about means to make them available. Uh, compared to the alcoholic solution, uh, in many places, uh, soap at least can be uh, accessible and uh, it's one of the things that we should work on. So if, if I may Thank add, the, there is a very yep. interesting initiative by a woman called uh, Miriam Sidi, who is a hand-washing uh, activist, I would say, who works by, for one of the soap manufacturing uh, companies who is mobilizing at the global level a group of uh, private sector partners to come together and work on seeing how to make soap available very widely to... Um, contribute to, to this response in African countries. They are aiming to start this in Kenya. They had a meeting the other day. So at least we, if we have that item provided by partners free of charge in health facilities and in homes for the community, and then work with our partners around the availability of water, this is something that can happen to then supplement the use of these uh, alcohol-based sanitizers. Thank you. We have over 220 journalists on, on the call at the moment. Um, and just want to say you can use the chat function on this call. We have someone reading that for us at the moment and going through. So if you can tell us your name and your news organization and uh, your question, we can put it to our guests from the World Health Organization. And just uh, one question that we have, I have got just come in is uh, Africa is obviously um, deeply experienced in malaria and a question from Nigeria from Madupe Adeloju says, uh, there are claims chloroquine can cure the virus. How true is this? And, um, you know, does that have specific relevance to the African situation, given, given the prevalence of malaria and given the availability of chloroquine? Dr. Moeti. Well, we are available sorry, we are aware of some um, trials of uh, the use of chloroquine in, uh, in dealing with uh, previous coronaviruses, not this virus. We're not aware of any evidence that shows, demonstrates that this is one of the medicines that could be used, but we can find out more information about that. There is a number of uh, trials of other medicines currently ongoing and we are waiting the outcome of, of those 
uh, observations of whether some medicines could be effective in, in treating the virus. But at the moment, we are not aware of any conclusive evidence to show that chloroquine could be effective in uh, treating this virus. Then we have a question from South Africa. I'm going to go to Dr. Kalua first on that. Uh, do you believe this is from Nabila Sheikh from ETV News in South Africa? And she asks, does uh, the WHO believe that South Africa should be placed on lockdown considering the rising number of COVID-19 infections? And should any support be offered to the country regarding informal settlements and townships? Dr. Kalua, any response to that question? Thank you very much. Uh, on the 15th of, uh, of March, uh, the president of South Africa declared a national disaster as regarding to uh, COVID-19. Uh, and with that, uh, there are a number of measures that were put in place that the country is going to follow in order to aggressively address the issue of uh, COVID-19 in terms of containment, and where possible and indicated to start to do uh, mitigation uh, uh, measures. But as to the question of lockdown, I suppose this, as in the first de decision of the measures, is a national decision. And uh, as and when the national authorities see fit that they need to implement these measures, then they will probably do so. But at the moment, that's not where the country is. There's just heightened uh, response across all sectors of government in trying to address the question of COVID-19. Now, the issue of informal settlement is quite, is quite critical and it's also a thing being discussed here in country that if we do get uh, the, 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 the COVID-19 into the informal settlements, it may become a bit more difficult to deal with. So some of the efforts are, uh, are trying to see what can we do to limit uh, to the more suburban areas where the, the problem is at the moment. But of course, the issues of hand washing, we have discussed the issues of uh, social distancing will become issues if we get the, the virus gets into informal settlements. And what we need to begin to think about is what are some of the innovative ways that we can apply to be able to do so, to be able to uh, implement these measures in, in the crowded uh, situations uh, as obtains in the informal settlements. Thank you. And we have a question, uh, just a follow up for you, Dr. Kalua, from uh, Janice Q at Bloomberg, who asks, how concerned are you about the number of test kits available to test for the virus in South Africa? And perhaps well, uh, some of your colleagues in other places can answer that too. Thank you. Uh, on the number of test kits uh, in, um, in, in the country, as you, uh, as you know, uh, this is a global uh, problem in terms of shortage of uh, test kits. But the government is working on that and we'll be working with them also to strengthen the capacity of testing. But what has happened is that the government has reached out to the private sector and has worked with laboratories in the private sector, which are also beginning to offer these tests. Beyond that, at first, the test was just being offered at the National Institute of Communicable Diseases in Johannesburg. And that institute has helped to build capacity on a number of laboratories in the provinces so that they too can begin to offer the test in terms of building the capacity. So the cooperation with the private sector and engaging them has been one of the, the mechanisms that have been put in place to include, to increase the access uh, to testing so that we can detect as many cases as possible and, and put in uh, the necessary measures to contain uh, the, the outbreak. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Moetti, to move back to you, a question from Ed Cropley from Reuters, who's asking where are Africa's government's going to find the money to pay for their antiviral responses, uh, given, the, uh, the, given the huge uh, obligations they have already? Hmm. Okay, uh, there's been, I can say, a very strong response at the international level of contributions and uh, commitments of financing to respond to the COVID-19 outbreak generally. And several donors have specifically indicated that they are very interested in, um, in supporting low resource settings, 
uh, settings with uh, weak health systems and specifically African countries. So we have had, um, first of all, the World Bank has um, pledged up to, or has decided to make available up to $12 billion for the, the response to the outbreak through several means, including for national responses, through some of the mechanisms of cooperation and financing between the World Bank and countries. This would require that the, the governments make a decision to benefit from this facility and indicate an interest through their ministries of, of finance and make a request through the, the World Bank country directors offices and countries for this money. In addition to that, the African Development Bank is looking at making some resources available. And then we have had uh, the European Union, other Western countries, um, other countries as well, some from the Middle East, through a mechanism that WHO has established of uh, putting in place a platform whereby countries develop their national plans for preparedness and response. WHO and other UN entities and partners then look together how to support these plans. So there is a facility for supporting national plans, supporting also partners' uh, plans in, in the action that we and other UN agencies and other um, non-governmental organizations, technical agencies are going to take to provide technical support to the countries for the work that they have to do. So I can say that there is a global platform into which um, entities with the resources can provide some funding for some of the work that is to be done. And some of this is also going to be offered by some of the private foundations, non-governmental organizations and charities that support development and health. So there has been, That's uh, I would say, a very positive response. It may, now we have to see if the funding will have to be enough. We are, of course, advocating with the governments themselves to provide some domestic financing for, for some of this work and in, invest in improving their health systems at the same time. Thank you so much, Dr. Mwati, um, and uh, thanks for those uh, answers. We've got a lot of questions coming in here. And I know we've got on the line from Business Day in South Africa, Tamar Khan. Tamar, you have a question. See if we can get your audio up. Hi. Hi there. Um, my question was about um, test kits for Africa. Do you have a forecast for the number of test kits that are um, or the anticipated demand? And what measures, if any, are in place to improve access and bring down the costs of these tests? I'm wondering whether there's any work going on in the way that um, the cost of ARVs was brought down very effectively. Is any similar work going on around testing and test kits? Thanks. Thank you. Um, about uh, testing, um, it will also evolve with uh, ongoing uh, uh, outbreak and increasing uh, numbers. Um, for example, we try to supply countries with uh, a basic of uh, 2,500 kits. That is uh, roughly uh, about uh, 200,000 for at least the 47 countries that our office is, is, is covering. So this is uh, roughly to start with and it's what they are using now. And most of them are actually requesting replenishment uh, just uh, a month uh, after. So this can roughly give an idea, but this uh, kind of need can easily increase when we have also increasing number of cases and where you may need at least to uh, test some of the contact becoming uh, symptomatic. So just to add, we are working on some of these projections and you can, as you can imagine, this is quite a challenge because the situation is changing so quickly in terms of uh, the numbers of countries that have cases. We have, of course, pre-positioned supplies, as my colleague said, in all the countries to make sure that they can, when, when they encounter a situation where they need to start testing, they can do so. So we are working to see what is the, the utilization rate, make some estimates of how this will expand as we see expanding numbers of, of cases. And as I said at the beginning, are also encouraging a very proactive case finding um, strategy that will demand even more um, test kits. So this is something that is, is a work in progress with our colleagues at the global level, really to see if we're going to support countries to contain the situation, to be more assertive in case finding, what sort of quantities will be required and what work then will need to be done to, to make sure that these are being produced 
are being procured and are being shipped and availed to countries. Thank you. And a couple of questions uh, on the same theme, one from Jude Egbass, who's a senior editor at Pulse Nigeria. And uh, on a similar thread, Elizabeth Merab from the East African newspaper in Kenya. Um, yesterday, the Director General in his press briefing said the cases being reported in Africa may be lower as more cases may be slipping through the cracks. What's your best estimate currently of Africa's infection numbers? Hmm. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's quite difficult to make an estimate of infection numbers because this, this infection can be asymptomatic. And, and that is the case all over the world. I think it's very difficult to estimate the numbers of people that are infected. We actually don't believe that there are large numbers of African people who are undetected and infected because this is an infection that has come in over the last three months. Initially, we were worried there might be people who are not infected. We have not seen people manifesting this illness in countries or we have not seen clusters of cases that might be suggestive of what had been previously undiagnosed uh, infection that is now resulting in serious illness. We have not seen that. So our sense is that this is a virus that is coming into countries through travelers from places where the infection is circulating. It may be that after a case has been in an aeroplane or in, an, in a locality, there may be some people who have been infected who may not have been detected. We have systems in place where countries are working very hard to identify the contacts of a case that has come in and to follow them up and to see if they then develop into cases, sometimes quarantining them, sometimes testing them. So although there may be some um, undetected uh, infections, we do not think that these are very large in number. And we can go to Kenya and Elizabeth Merab uh, from the uh, East African newspaper is there. Elizabeth, a uh, follow-up question from you. You had a number of questions, I think, but we've got time for one of them to uh, our panelists. Thank you so much uh, uh, for the opportunity. The other question we had was that, uh, Okay, about the testing kits, uh, it has been answered. But then there was the issue about uh, the robust uh, the robustness for East African countries to test uh, and to report the cases. Even that South Sudan, if I'm not wrong, and Burundi and Uganda are yet uh, have not test, have not reported any confirmed cases. Is it that they, they are none, or is it that they are just uh, not yet reported? Great question. Dr. Moeti or one of your colleagues? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that question, although uh, we really didn't get it clearly. But uh, I think you are asking that some countries in Africa, like Uganda, Burundi, and so on, have not reported the cases. And you think that maybe they are missing cases. Are, we, uh, they, are the systems robust enough? That's what I've understood. Indeed, there are countries which have not reported the cases, but what we have seen is they are applying the full measure of trying to find that case. They have actually what we are calling alerts. It means people who present with things which are similar to this coronavirus, they investigate, in, and in some cases they have gone up to testing, mm -hmm. and all in these countries have so far tested negative. And also they have measures like uh, trying to limit the movement of those they think are at high risk quarantine measures they are put in place. So the systems are there and it is the same systems which have picked cases in the countries which are reporting. So we do really believe that if the cases were there, they would be picked. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we've got uh, some questions too coming in about public health messaging across Africa where we've seen instances where it's incredibly difficult to get strong public health messages out. We have questions here asking if uh, ibuprofen is usable in treating it, if alcohol wards off harm to people who are infected. These all speak to uh, probably a big gap in people's knowledge about how to respond to this. So uh, Dr. Mweti and perhaps your colleagues, 
is there a strategy the WHO has in place to put out good information on this? I know this call is part of that process, but is there a wider strategy to help inform uh, the uh, people who are going to be affected by this virus about the kind of measures that are effective? Yes, indeed. There, there, is, um, uh, there is a risk communication, as we are calling it, and uh, <clears throat> community information strategy that is in place, working with governments and some of our partners. Uh, we are going to be working very strongly with UNICEF on this in the future, is what we are just agreeing, of putting out the correct information in, in several ways, through, if you like, the public media, the radio, television in countries, and very much working through community groups, working at the community level, through churches, church groups, through associations of people. And so this is something that we are aware um, needs to be addressed very strongly because we are aware that there are many false beliefs, there is incorrect information circulating around. And then as well, um, through the social media, you know, young African people are very connected through the social media and we're making them aware that at the global level in WHO, we have access to information which is correct, giving the right facts about, uh, about the, these problems. And we have an arrangement on the WHO website where people who are interested in information about uh, the coronavirus are led to correct information if they are going on Facebook or other platforms. So that they get the right information. We are very aware of the importance of correcting incorrect information and some of the information that would put people at risk if they believe they are falsely um, safe. We're very much putting out the simple right. information about the measures to take, uh, simple hygiene, social distancing, and, and reporting what types of symptoms to, to a health facility people get them. Thank you for that. We have a question from Thomas Muller on a slightly more positive note. We've talked about some of the disadvantages and challenges facing African health systems. Thomas Muller from Bloomberg is asking, uh, Africa has a relatively young population. Does that count in its favor? And it also has a great deal of experience in dealing with communicable disease, even in conditions where there's a big lack of resources. Do these things uh, speak in its favor? Dr. Mwerti. They do to some extent, although we, we also need to be evidence-based with, with regard to the demographic and be aware of some um, issues that may be at play in Africa, which are not in our region. I think certainly the in-depth experience that we've had with some very severe widespread outbreaks in the African region is, uh, is an advantage, it's an asset. For example, some of the work that we are doing has been based very much on the platforms that have been established in response to the Ebola outbreak and the preparedness that was in place for the Ebola outbreak that's just winding to a finish, we hope, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So the community platforms, the learnings from that experience and the mechanisms that are in, are in place are going to, to help us. And we do have a younger population than in many uh, countries that are affected by this outbreak. We just need to be aware that among uh, the young in Africa, in some settings, we have high rates of HIV prevalence. And in areas where we don't have universal access to treatment, they may then be people who are vulnerable because they're HIV infected and immune compromised. And, and equally, we have a very young population. We also have uh, malnutrition, uh, relatively highly prevalent compared to Asia or European countries. And this also may be a factor then that's making children or young people um, vulnerable to more severe forms of the illness than they have been seeing in other regions. But on the whole, I think our experience with outbreak is an asset. It's, it's, it's a, a positive for the African region. Two, que two questions from uh, Francophone media. I have Joan uh, Tilouin from Le Monde Africa Bureau. Uh, how do you work to avoid the mass spread of the virus in mega cities like Lagos, Kinshasa, and Luanda? And, um, and also, uh, from the Voice of America's French service, uh, Koi Guahinga, how does the WHO ensure that focus on COVID-19 does not distract from other more lethal ongoing crises? And he mentions uh, the 
uh, measles and cholera uh, outbreaks in countries like DRC. Yeah. Yeah. Perhaps Thank we could also bring in. Thank you very much. Uh, of, in fact, so what we are advising countries and we are helping them to, to have in place uh, at this time is that in these cities, uh, these sporadic cases should be strongly uh, managed. It's to ensure that at least uh, we have uh, a comprehensive uh, contact listing and follow up that any new uh, cases coming from these contacts can be quickly um, uh, diagnosed and uh, also isolated and receive the appropriate treatment. One of the critical things to, to, that we are doing also in the big cities is also a, a proper risk communication and uh, engaging communities to a wider uh, community-based uh, surveillance network that can help us uh, to detect. It involves also uh, all the community leaders and uh, also all the NGOs uh, around the, the table to uh, deal with uh, these uh, uh, issues. Um, other crises, uh, uh, actually, um, the, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the assets uh, in place for, for Ebola preparedness as well as even the normal influenza uh, program help to, um, to deal and to kick off uh, response in many places. And we are also uh, working with countries to ensure that uh, at least they have a mechanism to uh, deal at the same time with uh, all these uh, ongoing. Uh, so the idea is uh, uh, to um, uh, kind of uh, provide this um, uh, stronger response early and to avoid that uh, we have a bigger crisis that will disrupt totally uh, the system and affect other disease. And time being is uh, how can we manage both at this uh, stage? How can we continue uh, treating malaria, continue also dealing uh, with uh, safe burial uh, um, uh, services uh, so that uh, at least the, this, uh, we, not, we should not have a kind of a side effect uh, in terms of death toll related to other disease while emphasizing to control uh, corona. So this is a work in progress and working closely uh, with countries to have this uh, process of screening, uh, for example, uh, in hospitals so that you can have a channel to do corona while other patients will continue to receive treatment. So if I may Maybe. add a word, the fact sure. appeal to our colleagues and partners in the media to help with this, uh, so that we continue to keep an eye on, talk about, provide information about these other health problems at the same time as uh, providing information about the coronavirus. I, I've, I've just noticed that when I turn on my television or the radio at the moment, the, it, it's virtually only news about the coronavirus and its various aspects. So it would be great if we also got some uh, sending news out about the fact that we're counting down on the DRC, Ebola, the measles outbreak in there and the uh, other cholera problems still need attention. So that would be really good to do together. When we, we have repurposed many of our staff from other programs to support this uh, coronavirus response, but we have made sure that we keep intact the teams that have to work on the major outbreaks that are going on and just sustain the support from WHO to the work that those governments are doing. Thank you. If you may, I don't Thank so you. I just want to bring in Dr. Mbua from Senegal, if I may, just to get her perspective, mm -hmm. perhaps. Dr. Mbua, um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, we have a question from German uh, National Public Radio from Mark Engelhardt, who's asking, with the Global North uh, preoccupied currently, how concerned are you about the ability of um, West Africa to uh, cope uh, by itself without the traditional support it receives from donor countries? Sorry, I didn't uh, hear the question. So the question is, how concerned are you without support from traditional donor countries of, of the facilities on the ground in West Africa to cope with this uh, virus outbreak, as these countries traditionally give help are coping with it in Europe and the US and around the world? Okay, um, at this moment, US and uh, other uh, countries give help. 
and uh, we support the government to identify their needs and we just compile the needs and uh, we met this morning with uh, bilateral partners to to help to support the needs that were, uh, that were expressed and they are, they are they have the willingness to continue their support and uh, we we are here to coordinate uh, all these uh, supports uh, through a platform a regional and local platform of partners to address uh, uh, this fight i know we've uh, allowed 45 minutes for this uh, session uh, I think if, uh, if we may, we've got so many questions, if we could just uh, maybe take a few more. Uh, one question that's come up repeatedly from uh, our questioning uh, uh, audience online is really about the number of ICU facilities, ICU beds and uh, staff who can help with those most severely affected in this crisis. What is the situation like uh, across the continent for that kind of um, for those kinds of facilities? And where are the areas of concern, uh, Dr. Moetti, and where are the areas where you think uh, actually there are the facilities in place and there is the capacity? Um, yes. Uh, well, we are, we are collecting information right now on the capacity for critical care in, uh, in African countries. So uh, the number of beds, number of uh, specialists that know how to manage patients that need critical care, nurses, and so on. So it's not possible for me to give the numbers. What I can say is that we recognize that these are in very short supply in most of the, of, of the countries in the African region. So if, if we take a country like South Africa, which has one of the most developed, I would, I would say, health systems, both in the public and the private sectors in the region, they are recognizing too that looking at the evolution in terms of the number of cases, if the situation I feel like explodes in, in, in numbers and uh, large numbers of people have uh, severe disease and are critically ill, there will indeed be a challenge. And then the situation in most of the rest of the region is uh, more challenging than that. So that we recognize is going to be an area that, and we have is, is an area that does require um, in very serious uh, efforts and urgently needs uh, some intervention. We have been able to identify the possibility of uh, importing into countries, helping them to import what you might describe as a type of field hospital type of facility that can be brought into a country, set up and then equipped with some of the key items that are required, including ventilators, and sources of oxygen so that the type of critical care that it would be needed for serious uh, cases will be made available. This is truly one of the biggest challenges of the situation, but we are working very hard again with our colleagues at, uh, at other levels of WHO at the global level and with governments to work on this estimation of needs to at least expand some of the minimal capacity that is here, that is in place. We're also helping some of the countries to adapt existing facilities and have a facility that will take the first few cases while more expanded uh, space is being availed. This is part of what the, the funding that's being made available by the international community, including by the World Bank, is going to be utilized for, for example. And then we are carrying out um, training we have carried out some training here in Brazzaville, in Dakar, working with the Africa CDC. We're about to work with the, the Association of Physicians to carry out more training so that they in turn can, can train healthcare workers in countries, at least have the, the technical expertise, the skills available, even as the materials needed are being brought into the countries. We've seen, by the way, in uh, countries around the world that healthcare workers and medical professionals are amongst the most severely uh, affected by this. They get the most exposure almost of any single group. How uh, concerned are you about the measures in place to protect them? That's a question from Brian Pearson, Africa Confidential. I'll turn it over to Michelle Liao, one of my colleagues. Thank you. 
Yeah, of course, this is uh, really one of our major concerns uh, based on the situation in most of the uh, Africa uh, health facility settings, mainly when you move a bit out of the, the capital cities. Uh, actually, protective equipment is a challenge, and uh, we, it is, uh, the procurement uh, is uh, a bit difficult at this time as the use demand coming from almost all the countries around the world. Uh, WHO is uh, actually helping and facilitating procurement and uh, any support uh, from in this area for countries that want to support uh, African. We saw uh, some of the foundation, even the private, um, uh, trying to help countries is one of the areas where uh, support is welcome and uh, is where also uh, countries, uh, inside countries, if there is a possibility for in-country procurement, uh, I think national authorities should emphasize on. Um, so in Ebola, we saw also many health workers uh, being uh, affected, and uh, it's one of the actually concerns that uh, need to be addressed uh, with uh, all the different partners. Uh, probably time for just a couple of, uh, of questions uh, to to conclude. Uh, one is, can African countries economically afford to put in place travel bans and restrictions to stem the spread of the disease? That question from Yinka Shakunbi uh, in Nigeria. And also, we have a question from uh, a radio network that uh, sends uh, a signal broadcast out to sub-Saharan Africa from David Mowbray, who says, will the WHO be providing message packages on the coronavirus? Um, Dr. Mwati. Yes. Yeah, so, so we are observing, of course, the a raft of measures, including border closures uh, by countries in our region, as well as in other regions, while at the same time, we are learning a lot about the economic impact at the global level and also uh, expecting to see then uh, the economic impact of these barriers being placed in the way of goods and people and money moving between countries in trade and so forth. This is a big concern. Um, we are encouraging countries to take measures that will isolate the virus, isolate perhaps the people who might have the virus and really minimize unless it's absolutely necessary isolation in, of countries, while at the same time putting in place very strong measures of identifying those who are infected and contact tracing so that we limit the spread of the virus. So th this is a concern. What we are deciding to do, because we are concerned as well about the impact of such measures on the ability to move some of the goods around that directly contribute to the control and containment and uh, care and treatment of people who are affected by this uh, by this outbreak and also other basic social services including other health services so the movement of medicines test kits other commodities that are needed and as well the movement of those people that are needed to provide support to countries including our staff from who but also from other experts from other agencies who really need to be able to, to get between countries because the country's capacities, countries are not self-sufficient. We are receiving help, um, requests for help with providing different types of experts in countries. So for us, this is a concern. We hope to have the opportunity to advise on when it might not be uh, perhaps absolutely necessary to do so. But at the same time, then we are intending to negotiate, to have discussions, to have what are called humanitarian corridors availed so that uh, some special um, commodities arrangements can be made for moving those items, commodities and people that are absolutely essential for supporting the response to and putting an end to this outbreak and also making sure that basic and essential services are available for people. So we have a uh, Maya on the line, I think. Um, can't quite catch the name. If we can put the audio through, uh, just to ask a question, please. Yes, thank you very much. I, I have a question for Dr. Moetti. How is coordination working? Can you just tell us your name and news organization? Please? Yes, it's Maya Plants from The Shift from Brazil. 
It is a question for Dr. Moeti. How is coordination working among the World Health Organization offices in Sub-Saharan Africa to deliver communications campaigns to inform the general public on preventive measures to contain, mitigate the virus transmission? I hear that WhatsApp is often used to spread the misinformation, disinformation among the most vulnerable. That's a question for Dr. Moiti. Okay, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you clearly, but I think you were asking about the collaboration between individual country offices on- Right, the coordination as far as communications campaign. Because uh, that's there is a lot one of my things that I have to social media. Yeah, would you like to? Yes. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, the collaboration between uh, WHO offices uh, between countries as well as region is quite well established, and uh, most of the uh, guidance uh, are uh, widely shared to each of the country as well as uh, the region. And there is also a regular uh, discussion, almost mm. daily, uh, between uh, the. Uh, the headquarter and all the, the region and concern coming from countries also uh, brought uh, up to the headquarter uh, where we have some of the services that are centralized like a global procurement as well as also mobilizing technical aspect uh, to reflect on some of the critical issues like uh, mm -hmm. the research areas and also some of the a uh, question that we are asking ourselves in the field, uh, like uh, some of the projection models, uh, etc. So this collaboration is uh, well mm -hmm. established between countries and between also region and, uh, and the headquarter. Thank you. Um, Very quickly, uh, before, we, uh, before we go, I, uh, we're running out of time here on this session. We have a question about school closures. Uh, Lagos has just announced all schools will be closing from Monday. A question from Simon Ataber at Today News Africa in Washington, D.C., who asks, is this an overreaction or is this the right step at this moment, given that there were eight cases in Nigeria at the moment? Um, yes, uh, you know, the, the, this is a demonstration of a, <clears throat> a decision to take strong, <coughs> excuse me, preventive and precautionary measures once the, the virus has started to circulate at the community level and, and limit, um, if you like, the regular congregation of people who then can pass the, the virus around. I, I think as WHO, we, we encourage strong measures early on to contain the outbreak. And then I think it very much depends on local situations and what, um, what people see as the, the risks then of uh, the free movement of uh, people, including children, interaction for hours on end among themselves where the exchange of the virus might be facilitated when they then go home and can spread it around in, in families. So we are learning more and more as we analyze what has been done in different settings and in different countries to try to calibrate when might be the right moment to put in place these measures. At the moment, I think it's quite difficult to say definitively yes or no. What we understand is the earlier this is done before you have widespread, uh, the better. And perhaps if you are in a setting where controlling once the virus has gotten out uh, based on the conditions can be very difficult. It is a, a wise thing to do to put these measures in place earlier rather than later. This is what I would say as, as a comment on this. Thank you very much. Um, we've got a lot of questions. We will be sure to pass them on to our colleagues and friends at the WHO. Um, I just want to thank Dr. Moeti, the Regional Director for Africa, her colleagues, Dr. Yoti and Dr. Yao, for joining her in. Congo Brazzaville, uh, also in Senegal, Dr. Imbua, and in South Africa, Dr. Owen Kalua. Thanks to all of them for making themselves available for questions um, and for their time. Thanks to everyone for joining online. Apologies to all the many questions we couldn't get around to answering, but we will be passing them along. And uh, I hope this was uh, uh, an informative session for everybody. Our thanks here from Geneva and goodbye. 
Thank you. Thank you for helping us to, to spread this information around. Oh, I've seen us. <laughs>